happy to be interrupted too. Perfect. Okay. Sounds good. Well, I will let you go. I'll Great. see you in a sec. Okay. All right. Bye. Okay, so a little bit about my background. So as I said, I'm a movement disorders physician. That means specially trained in, in managing Parkinson's disease. Um, and I'm a neurologist. That's kind of um, usually how you get there. Um, at OHSU and um, the Parkinson Center of Oregon, and then also at the, at the VA. Um, I actually spent a year of my training at the University of Massachusetts. And, and the the information there that's that's interesting is that um, the mindfulness-based stress reduction program um, that the Brian Grant Foundation is going to be offering was actually um, developed at the University of Massachusetts or UMass, it's commonly called, um, by John Kabat-Zinn, who was a, um, a PhD professor there at the time. I'm not sure if he's still there, to be honest, but I was able to take care, um, part in the mindfulness um, class myself while I was there absolutely loved it um, and really was interested when I started um, fellowship out here at OHSU um, in, in trying to do um, more research in this area. So that was about 14 years ago now. Um, and when I first as a fellow presented the idea of doing research in mindfulness, the response was, oh, that's ridiculous. No one's going to fund that. And um, it's too wishy-washy. People aren't going to aren't going to like that. Um, and it would have been great if I had pursued it then because I would have been way ahead of the curve um, as mindfulness has become more and more, um, I think, accepted and looked at and appreciated. Um, so I have done some, some minor research in the area. Um, at this point, I'm not doing quite as much on the, the research side, so not pursuing um, a lot in the, the research realm, but do speak often on mindfulness to groups um, really think it's a it's a wonderful tool and really think stress and stress reduction is, is key. So I was really excited when um, Katrina contacted me about um, the Brian Grant Foundation starting this class. Um, like I said, I took the class myself. Katrina, Katrina's taken the class herself and um, she's kind of drinking the Kool-Aid, Kool so to speak, um, which I, I did as well. And I think it's just an amazing um, amazing resource. Um, I've retaken the class um, since the original um, time that I took it, now about 15 years ago. Um, I've done some other kind of related classes where it's not just mindfulness, but but an incorporation of a few things. And then, like I said, I've done a little bit of research in the area um, as well. So um, just to talk about what I'll talk about, um, I'll do a little bit about emotional stress in the brain, just kind of in general, and then talking about what emotional stress is, and then emotional stress in Parkinson's disease, both in terms of the development of the d disease and then the symptoms, and then stress reduction and what mindfulness specifically is, and then talk about some mindfulness successes, both in um, some other diseases and then in, in Parkinson's as well. So this is a busy slide. The point is not for you to, to look at all the, the details and I'll have a few busy slides, unfortunately. It's just kind of the nature of this, this topic. But um, I think the big thing to look at here is there's a lot going on with stress. So it's not just one thing. And I really equate stress and stress reduction to exercise um, because I think both of them deal with all these different parts of our, our brain and our body. Um, and we know that Parkinson's doesn't just affect one thing, right? It, it causes constipation, it causes depression, it causes your movements to change. It's a lot that's going on. And we've had so many pharmacological studies where we've tried to, to slow the progression of um, Parkinson's and it fails. Um, exercise looks pretty promising. It's hard to prove that for sure, but it looks pretty promising that it's actually slowing the progression of the disease. And I think stress reduction really has that same potential. And I think for both of them, it's because it does affect a lot. That means it's messy and it's harder to do research in, but I think it's also potentially that you're getting you know, a lot more bang for your buck. So that's kind of what this is to show is that there's a lot going on with um, with stress in the body, and it's not just doing one thing. And um, Iris just mentioned about inflammation, and um, stress increases in our inflammation. So reducing stress um, can potentially reduce our inflammation. Um, there's oxidative stress, stress there's neuro, neuro um, decreased neurogenesis, so actually reduction in your ability to create new not neurons. 
um, increase in neurodegeneration, so increase in the breakdown of things. So all these things that, that are not good, you know, are related to stress. So what is emotional stress? Um, this is sometimes harder to understand than it, than it seems like it should. And a lot of what the mindfulness class actually starts with is, is trying to think about stress and what does stress look like. I sometimes think that it's easier to look at what isn't stress as opposed to what is. So, you know, thinking about sitting on the beach, relaxing, beautiful sunset, watching the waves, um, you know, for I think the vast majority of people that would be pretty relaxing. So the, the antithesis, the opposite of, of emotional stress. Um, this is an older scale that looks at stressful life events. And the reason I like to, to show this is that sometimes things that are stressful are actually good things. So number seven is marriage. So the seventh most stressful thing that can happen to you in your life is to get married. We think about that as being a very positive thing, right? But even positive things can bring stress to our life. Um, I actually can share something this morning. We made an offer on a house yesterday. I am uh, just got an email that they think it's probably going to be accepted. That's a good thing, but it's a little hard giving a talk after just hearing that information. Um, and it's kind of, you know, my heart's racing a little bit. I'm a little like, whoa, okay, what's going to happen? Um, Taking on a mortgage, <laughs> that's where I am right now, I guess, number 20 there. Um, and especially as you get into um, these, these lower ones, vacation, major holidays, these are things that, that do cause stress and we can have a lot of things kind of build up. So 150 points or less on the scale means you're um, relatively low amounts of life change and low sus sus excuse me, susceptibility, distress-induced health burnout. 150 to 300, about a 50% chance in the next two years. And 300 or greater, there's about an 80% chance that you're gonna have some stress-induced um, uh, breakdown of your health. Um, so again, what is emotional stress? Um, so this is um, a number of years ago um, when I was on vacation with my um, young son. I was actually pregnant in this picture as well. This is kind of the, the good picture of all the stress, right? Um, this is kind of the, the reality, more likely. My parents had also moved to town um, not too much before that. This is now with the, the baby born. Um, I think my husband's back there doing something in the kitchen. But um, my score at that point was 290. So pretty high, even though you know I had a, I had a good job, I had good family support, um, I had two healthy children. So again, you know, good things can, can lead to a lot of stress. And, and that's, um, that's important to know because I think stress reduction is for everybody, not just um, for people who we classically think of maybe experiencing depression, anxiety, things like that. So also what's stressful for one person may not be stressful for another person. I actually had this in the slide in my talk prior to um, giving this talk for, for the Brian Grant Foundation because I've given um, some related talks before. But for Brian Grant, you know, probably going up for that foul shot was not that stressful, right? If you're going to get super stressed out doing that foul shot, you're not going to make it. And NBA players can make the shot most of the time. So for them... You know, there's things that for some of us, if I was put in that situation, I would be shaking and, you know, just really not be able to perform. But for them, this is a, a stress that they, they learn to, to manage and maybe even not a stressful situation. Um, for others of us, this is um, a picture from John's Marketplace. I don't know if anyone's um, in the, the Portland area probably has been to John's Marketplace. I live just down the street from Multnomah Village and um, go to John's often. They have an unbelievable beer selection. It's insane. Um, but for me, this is actually a little bit of a stressful experience going into John's because every time I'm like, oh, there's so many choices. What do I get? Do I get bottles? Do I get cans? Do I try something different? Do I go with my old favorite? So many choices. So again, stress can come from things that seem pretty basic or big things may not be stressful for us depending on, on how we approach it. So um, does emotional stress increase the risk of developing Parkinson's? Hard question to answer, but maybe. And that's most of this talk is going to be maybe um, is, is, is the amount of, of research we have. But um, there was a study done a number of years ago looking at average number of life stressful life events in persons with Parkinson's and, and persons without. 
And um, they found, sorry, go back there. Um, they found that in persons who had Parkinson's, they had experienced 7.2 um, stressful life events. And these were like big um, things over, over years. And then 0.93 in persons without um, Parkinson's, so less than one. Um, and these were, were kind of major things, death and disease, children's deaths, spouses' deaths, you can see kind of um, down there, but, but big, um, big things. And I think you know, I haven't looked at the study very recently. I think it was like over the um, five years before diagnosis. I believe it was about that, that ballpark, but it was for a period um, before the diagnosis. So is this, you know, clearly representative that it does? No, but it's, it's suggestive um, that there may be a relationship there. Um, does emotional stress affect Parkinson's symptoms? Well, if you read any movement disorders textbook, it says, and stress makes the symptoms worse. Um, again, the data is a, is a little variable, but it seems like, um, and a little limited, tremor, dyskinesia, and freezing of gait. So tremors, you know, the back and forth regular movement, dyskinesia is that wiggly kind of fidgety movement. Um, if you ever see Michael J. Fox interviewed, he's got pretty significant dyskinesias. Um, and then freezing of gait. So that one, your feet kind of get stuck and you can't, you can't get your foot to move. All those things seem pretty affected by, by stress. Um, this was actually studied and in 1967, um, and another, another uh, title I've given in doing this talk was what the um, 60s got right about health and well-being, because I think in the 60s there was this, um, this more of a connection between mind, body, um, you know, stress, and so forth. So this was a study done by um, Dr. Marsden, who is considered the father of movement disorders in 1967. And um, that picture there is, um, is what people's tremor looks like. And the first one, they just gave people saline, so salt water. And um, you see a little bit blips of tremor, but nothing, nothing major. And then they give people an injection of adrenaline and it got going fairly, you know, briskly. And, and then they made them do mental arithmetic and it got going much, much more briskly. So, um, so basically math uh, gives you more natural adrenaline and makes your tremors worse than um, giving adrenaline itself. So kind of a neat old study there. Um, and then this was a, a very recent um, paper that was published. And this was done by a survey. So surveys aren't you know, the strongest evidence that's out there, but they looked at 5,000 patients. So pretty, pretty big numbers of patients and did, um, did this big survey. And they asked people, and I think often, you know, you guys know as patients, you're pretty good reporters of your own symptoms, um, of how their symptoms changed with stress. So um, the, the maximum it could worsen was here. This black line in the middle is that there was no change in their symptoms. And then the other side is that, that it improved. So um, tremor was the one that stood out the most as getting worse with stress, sleep problems, depressed mood, um, slowness or bradykinesia, the gait and the freezing, and then dyskinesias. Um, so that, that all these things for, for the majority of people got worse with stress. There was a, a variation there um, and not, not everyone um, experienced that same thing. And some people said things improved with stress. So maybe um, for some people, either what they judged as stress maybe wasn't really stress or um, you know, they might just react to things that other people would consider stressors in a, in a different way. So what do we do about stress, right? So this is something um, we can't really avoid. Um, so we're gonna have to have to figure out how to manage it. Um, so exercise is a, is a good one. This is actually from a, a Parkinson's walk. And I know um, Brian Grant Foundation too has many exercise resources and um, there's amazing resources that for this um, throughout Parkinson's. And I think it's really a key component. Um, and even within mindfulness, sometimes there's some, some incorporation of um, exercise, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and then yoga. Again, this is a slide I had before, before doing this topic. So this is um, Brian Grant. I think this was at the World Parkinson's Foundation um, a number of years ago. Um, or sorry, we're Parkinson's Congress a number of years ago, and um, Indu Subramani, who's a movement disorder specialist um, in, in Los Angeles. Um, and I think they did a yoga session together at the World Parkinson's Congress. And this is, again, something that is often incorporated into mindfulness um, as well. 
And then meditation, this goes back to the 60s things, right? This is the Beatles, which um, I suspect most of you recognize who they are. <laughs> and um, I think they're guru there. And they did a lot with meditation. Um, and that's, that's a component of mindfulness as well. So um, what is mindfulness? I think this picture is one of those, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, and here we've got the person and they're out for a walk, right? It's this lovely sunny day, the trees are out. It's just, you know, nice. And here they're thinking about, oh, their car's not working right. They've got all this mail to deal with. This may be their boss upset about something. Um, this may be their, their daughter needs something going on. Um, their socks don't match. I don't know if that's what that is meant to be, but just all these thoughts kind of racing through their minds, right? And instead of just enjoying this lovely picture, they're focused on all these, these other things. Um, and then here is the, the dog, um, just taking in the beautiful nature that's there and um, actually being in the moment, enjoying the moment. So either our um, mind being full or being mindful. Um, another one that I really like that John Kabat-Zinn um, had said in one of, his, one of his books was, when you're in the shower, be in the shower. Don't be at work, don't be cooking dinner, don't be um, you know, mowing your lawn just be in the shower, enjoy that, that time. I was actually thinking that to myself this morning, trying to um, just enjoy that time and, and, and think about the, the warm water on my hair and the, the, the nice experience of that um, and not thinking about all the other things that, that were going on. So in terms of an actual definition, we say mindfulness is a means of improving mental health and reducing symptoms of stress. Mindfulness is a moment-to-moment -moment, non judgmental awareness and a means to reduce stress and improve coping. The programs focus on tools to cope with intense physical and emotional situations, relaxation practices such as meditation and yoga, and discussion of the techniques. So a lot of the, um, the aspects of, of mindfulness through the class that's important, and I'll, I'll go through a little bit more specifics on this, is that the, the discussion in the group of um, how the techniques have gone, how you feel about those techniques, getting input from others about how their practice is going, um, techniques or ideas on how to improve things, what things you're struggling with. So there's also a, a component of um, community that comes from it. And if anyone um, is involved in um, support groups at all, um, I think you can probably relate to how that, that might be really helpful. And I think it's really, um, it was, in my experience, it was really a, a great component of the class to, to hear what everyone else um, was going through and to be able to, to discuss um, the, the things that were good and the things that were tough. This isn't, this isn't always easy. Um, you know, to, to focus on these things. So there's a lot out there in mindfulness. This was a um, time cover uh, quite a few years back now um, about the mindful um, revolution. And, and it's kind of um, over, it's everywhere, right? To a certain degree. But I think it also has become everywhere because we've got this kind of stressed out, multitasking, go, go, go society of when you're out for that walk, um, you can't just focus on the trees because your cell phone's buzzing or um, you got a text that you got to respond to or, um, you know, it's, it's hard to unplug, right, and, and really separate from things. And then um, I think it's also um, kind of interesting to think about this muddied meaning of mindfulness. This was from a New York um, Times magazine, you know, the one that comes out on Sundays. And um, that there's a lot of different ways that mindfulness has done out, of, out there. And you might read some different things. Um, and as Katrina said at the beginning, the mindfulness-based stress reduction is really the gold standard. Is it the best? Is it the ultimate way to do it? We don't know, you know, because there haven't been been great comparison studies. Um, but it's really the one that's been studied the most. Um, there's a pretty clear structure generally to, to how it goes, um, and so I, I think 
it's kind of an ideal way if you're either um, having done some some practice and interested in diving more in, or if you don't have any exposure to it at all, it's it's really a great um, great place to start because it, it it is a really um, well studied, well done, um, well organized uh, program. So this is what the um, program typically looks like. Um, and this was taken from an article um, looking at uh, veterans with, with PTSD um, and the way they did it. So there can be some slight um, variability, but this is, this is really the, the main thing. And also because um, it is being given in um, a group setting and there's discussions involved sometimes how um, these end up flowing individual classes, it um, will vary a little bit. So um, there's eight um, two-hour sessions um, over the course of eight weeks, so they're once a week, and then you are asked to do um, an hour a day of um, weekly, an hour a day every day of the week, aside from the, the um, day of your class, um, some practices on your own. Um, I would say, having done the class a couple of times, no one um, ever really does the hour every day. Um, I think most people get in, you know, the 15, 30 minutes. Um, some people do get in the, the full hour or maybe do it a couple days a week and not, not get it. Um, so it, it is called practicing with the idea that, that we can always um, keep improving on things. But the first class um, would be kind of an in introduction, um, might be kind of the focus on a, that there's more that, that that's right than wrong with you. Um, generally, there's an exercise done called the raisin exercise, focus on mindful eating, um, a grounding practice, and a, a body scan, which is where you kind of focus on different parts of the body and kind of relax them um, progressively from your feet up to your brain. And then the next one, um, focusing on stress, um, how our perceptions and our experience impact our mood and our um, physiology of our body. And then again, doing the mindfulness scan and working on some mindfulness breathing. Um, next one, noticing experiences and savoring what's pleasant. And then again, in terms of practices, I won't go through all these, but mindful movement. Um, the next class, kind of getting unstuck, noticing unhelpful patterns. Um, one that might be introduced there is a loving kindness um, meditation, which is a really lovely one. And then a short um, thing called a three minute breathing space. So kind of just taking a, a brief three minutes aside to focus on breathing. Um, spaciousness uh, for class five, they did in this one, chronic pain for number six. There's generally a half day retreat. Um, and that uh, tries to have as much silence um, as possible and does a lot of all different kinds of, of meditation um, throughout the day. And then um, interpersonal mindfulness. Um, I did ask uh, Kertrude when we talked about things uh, earlier, if it would be open for um, care partners to be involved. And it sounds like they are very open to that. Um, and in the classes I have taken, um, it's been really neat to see um, some of the communication that's gone on um, between caregivers and um, patients or persons with Parkinson's and, and their caregivers. Um, when I did it at UMass, actually, um, I wasn't um, involved with anyone with Parkinson's taking it, but I had um, a woman in the class who was pregnant, um, wasn't married, and was living with her mother. Um, and they were gonna be um, entering this big change in life of, of caring for this new baby um, and living under the same roof. And it was really cool to see um, their communication and, and that idea that they were kind of preparing for this ahead. And I've seen it with some married couples, which has been really neat too. Um, and then lastly, forgiveness and moving on. Um, and again, um, there's various uh, practices that are incorporated throughout. And um, this is kind of the general structure. Some of the specifics can vary a little bit from group to group. And again, if, for example, um, the chronic pain session, there's a lot that's there and a lot that's discussed, the group might come back to that and spend some additional time on it. Um, whereas um, something else may be kind of a, a bit of a shorter discussion then. So um, thinking about some mindfulness successes, this isn't a comprehensive um, example of things at all. I just pulled out a couple of things. It's um, 
gets a little bit tough these days because there is so much literature out there that I did kind of a, a quick look. Um, and one of the things that was hard in trying to get an overview is that now there's so much in so many different areas that there's not kind of one good single overview. So I'll actually show kind of an older study um, as, as one of the examples because it, it's a little bit more of a, a pervasive um, review of things. So the first one I wanted to, to highlight um, was a study that was done in multiple sclerosis. So multiple sclerosis or MS is another um, a nervous system disease. It's um, a neuroinflammatory disease actually. And um, the, the thing that makes um, studying this in multiple sclerosis um, kind of nice is that in multiple sclerosis, they, we can look at the brain and see if new lesions have developed. So we can see if the disease is active or not. Um, in Parkinson's, we don't have a great way to do that. So we can follow symptoms, but we don't have any way to really see is the disease progressing, is the disease changing. Um, and what they did was they did a mindfulness course and they had a group that got the course and a group that didn't. And the group that um, got the course is in the blue and the group that didn't is um, in the red. And then they looked at um, how many people had new lesions um, during the 24 week um, treatment period. And this was a little bit of a variation on the, on the classic mindfulness program. So it wasn't the, the MBSR specifically. Um, but they found that um, you can see in this, um, in the group that got the intervention, the blue group, a lot more of them are without new lesions than in the red group. Um, and this is a gadolinium enhancing, and then this is the T2, um, which is just another way we, we look at um, the, the different lesions. So, but between these two, both groups, you can see very, you know, um, prominent differences. And this just means that it was significant. The p-value was, um, was low. So this is objective evidence that, you know, um, mindfulness is helping with and changes that are happening in the brain. So pretty exciting um, stuff. And then this is that older article um, I was saying that this looked at, um, it was back from 2015, but I kind of like it because it looks at a few things. But the, the main things that they showed um, the most benefits in were depression um, and anxiety. So pretty consistently um, mindfulness program showed um, benefits in these. There's one here that is a little bit um, variable. But these are the areas where we, we think probably um, the most um, benefits from mindfulness are gonna come. And these were in a variety of um, populations. So people with cardiovascular disease, cancer, um, mental health disorders, so anxiety and depression, PTSD, um, chronic pain, and then one was in um, healthy patients. Again, none of these in um, Parkinson's, but I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more specifically. So um, in terms of mindfulness and Parkinson's, there's about 10 studies. Um, I, again, have to admit, I didn't do a, a thorough you know, um, review of the literature for this. There was a review done um, not too long ago, and then I found um, one additional study beyond that. Um, and they also show in, some improvements. Um, the improvements tend to be fairly modest. Um, so these aren't usually, um, you know, dramatic improvements. The numbers are also pretty small for most of the studies, so that always makes it, it difficult to interpret. Um, is this a coincidence that we saw um, some benefit? Would we see a lot more benefit if we had a lot more people? Um, the largest study had 71 people in the intervention group and 67 in the um, control group, but most of the studies were more about 15, 20 um, per groups. And the areas um, where they saw improvement included motor function, depression, anxiety, and quality of life. So um, kind of running the gamut, which is, you know, what we would expect um, with uh, the um, idea that this is affecting a lot of things within the brain, not just one. And then the depression and anxiety really fit with that, um, what has been shown in general with mindfulness, that it, it can particularly help with those types of symptoms. So this is, again, going back to that survey study, and I apologize, this is a bit of a busy slide, but they looked at how often people did mindfulness and the effects on various symptoms. And the reason why this is nice is um, in looking at 
evidence, we'd like to see a dose response so that, you know, you take more of a drug, you see more benefit, you take less of a drug, you see less benefit. Um, and, and the same should be true for, for other interventions. So this was looking at people who did once a month or less, a few times a month, weekly, several times a week, daily, or several times a day. And we see that with basically everything that they looked at, everything's improving with the more you do it. Um, and these include depressed mood and anxiety, and those are the ones at the top, kind of like we would expect. Um, tremor uh, and is, is kind of in the next range, and then sleep problems, gait freezing, they kind of go back and forth a little bit there. Um, and then slowness of movements or bradykinesia and then dyskinesia. Um, so again, going along with what we've kind of seen from, from other things that all these things can potentially improve with mindfulness. Um, I think we have time. I can ask Katrina if it's okay if we do a little bit of a guided meditation to um, or guided imagery to give people a little exposure to, to a moment of mindfulness maybe. I'm gonna move forward if I if I don't hear it. Yes, Sounds please. Great. Yeah, 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 go for it. <laughs> I need this, I need this myself. So yeah. Um, <laughs> So I'm just going to go through a brief um, guided imagery. This is again not, um, you know, the the full component of mindfulness, but one of the one of the potential pieces. And um, we'll do it that we're pretending we're we're out on this um, beautiful beach. So if you're sitting, um, that's usually kind of the the best place to try to um, focus on on meditations. Um, and you just want to have a, a nice stance. You want to kind of be intentionally sitting. So if you're slouching, try to try to sit up straight. Um, and then you want to take a couple of deep breaths. So breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. In through your nose and out through your mouth. Maybe do about five of those at your own pace. And then just to start to focus on um, your, your body in the chair. So maybe feel the feet, your feet on the floor. Maybe it's the toe pads that are touching or your heel that's more touching. And just kind of focus how your feet feel on the floor. And then maybe focus on where you're sitting on your buttocks, how that's seated in the chair, what parts of your bottom or touching the chair. And now maybe on your back, is it is it touching against the, the back of the chair? Do you feel air kind of circulating there? Do you feel a coolness? Do you feel warmth anywhere in the body? And if you haven't already, maybe just let your eyes close. And then we're going to start to imagine that we're on a beach and we're sitting in a beach chair and we're going to imagine what's around us. So we can first think of what we hear, maybe some seagulls in the distance, the lapping of the waves as the water comes in from the ocean. Perhaps the sound of children laughing in the distance. And just think in your mind about if you were at the beach, the sounds that, that would be coming to you. And then maybe think about what you would feel if you were on the beach. Perhaps the sun is shining on your forearms and warming them, shining on your face and again, warming your cheeks. Perhaps you can feel the cool sand in between your toes. Again, just take a moment to think about the feelings you'd have in your body if you were sitting on the beach. And now maybe think about 
what you would smell, that salt water smell in the air, maybe coconut sunscreen, the smell of fish sometimes. And again, just take a moment to think of the smells that you might experience on the beach. And then finally, think about what you would see. Think about the vast water in front of you, perhaps ships out in the distance. Again, the in and out of the waves, back and forth. Perhaps the seashells, again, that are brought in by the waves and taken back out. And then I'll just give you a moment to just continue to imagine what you would about being on the beach and what the experience would be like for you. Now take a couple deep breaths again. Start to move away from the beach. You can kind of wiggle your toes, wiggle your fingers. You can gradually start to open your eyes. It's often nice to just kind of restrict your gaze and look down at the ground. And then just gradually let the room come back into view. So if people want to put in the chat how that felt, um, it's kind of a nice, I think, time to do that. Um, also, if it was difficult, if it was pleasant, and um, if it's difficult, that that isn't a sign that mindfulness isn't for you. Um, Katrina and I were talking about this recently as well. It may be a sign that that it is for you and that that you really need it actually, because. Um, it's, it's sometimes quite, quite difficult to, to let your body um, get to that, that more relaxing phase. And um, I remember in this small pilot study I did with mindfulness and um, I had a patient in it who um, had a really marked tremor. And um, he said, oh my gosh, that's the first time my tremor stopped when we did our, our first uh, meditation um, in years. And that's the first time it's really totally gone away when I was sitting still like that. Um, so it was really powerful to, to hear that. And um, I hope other people have that experience and, and can continue to, to use these techniques to, to help um, in managing symptoms. And hopefully, you know, we, we hope that this is maybe even changing the, the course of the disease potentially. Um, so in terms of mindfulness resources, I wanted to kind of finish up with that. Um, obviously, Katrina is going to tell you a lot about the, the Brian Grant um, Foundation course, which is um, so wonderful that, that they're offering that. And I would really um, recommend people try to take advantage of it if they're, if they're able to. Um, there's also some other resources if for some reason the Brian Grant course doesn't, doesn't work with your, your time schedule or um, if there's other restrictions. Um, Brown University has a, has a very big center for mindfulness. There's actually a, a gentleman there, um, Jeffrey Pru, who used to be at OHSU and, and worked with me on the one study I did, who um, is there now doing uh, mindfulness research primarily with um, Native American communities with indigenous populations. Um, and then UMass Memorial Medical Center, that's the University of Massachusetts, um, they were kind of at the forefront of things and, and still have a lot of offerings. Um, and then University of California at San Diego has a great center for mindfulness too. Their, um, what's really great about their website is it has a ton of different um, audio files that you can download um, with various meditations and they're from very short ones to very long ones, their guided imagery, their body scans, their all over the place, all different um, people who've uh, recorded them. So some voices you'll find, I 
hope mine isn't a bad one, um, you'll find that really uh, speak to you and really help you relax. And then other voices for some reason just, just don't um, work as well. So it's kind of nice because there's a lot of options there. And then there's oftentimes local resources. Um, I know OHSU periodically does do classes. I haven't looked um, lately what, what their offerings is. Or, excuse me, what their offerings are. Um, and I also had done one um, through a yoga center here in, um, in Portland, actually in the Selwood area um, as well. So that's often something, um, no matter where you are, that there it's very likely that there's um, local groups doing it. And especially if something, um, you know, in person would work better for you, or that just seems like it would be a better fit. Um, that's something to, to look into. You can, you can usually just Google mindfulness. And um, again, the classic is kind of this mindful, mindfulness-based stress reduction um, class. And I think MBSR is the abbreviation. Um, so the Brian Grant Foundation course, which Katrina will um, talk a little bit more about in just a minute. And that's the end of my